Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today's video, we are looking at how I prepare for DJ sets. It's one of the most asked questions on Instagram story. And today I'm gonna to share with you some insights and some things I've learned over the years on how best to prepare for a gig. So currently I am playing a combination of both vinyl and digital. There's been no gigs for 18 months. Depending on when you watch this, right now I am one day before my first ever gig back. So I've really refreshed myself on how to prepare for a gig. I had a gig last Saturday in Maidstone, which is a socially distanced one. And if I'm completely honest, I did not know what to expect. And with it being a first gig, it was kind of good because it eased me back into what is to come. And played the gig, was good, but I wasn't that organized. So then this week I've really had to think about how I can be better prepared. Friday's You and Me show, which is my own club night, and how I can really deliver the best performance possible for the ravers in attendance. So yeah, this video is being recorded when it's completely fresh in the mind. So on my right, I have got my record bag, which is the airbag, and I'm gonna do a separate video on this at some point. Then left, we've got the trusty old MacBook, which has got record box on, which is the software I use to organize my music for gigs. So whether you're playing vinyl or digital, it really does not make a difference. I think the way you prepare should be similar. And honestly, no one in the crowd cares if you're playing vinyl or digital. However, there is still an ongoing debate between very strange people about what is better. But personally at the moment, moving towards playing more records, I just prefer the feeling and I know my records better than my digitals right now. And we're gonna talk about that in this video. The first thing you need to do when preparing for a gig is listen to music in full. This sounds super obvious, but from past experience, when you go to a gig and you're playing tunes that you've not really listened to in full, you can get some nasty surprises. And we're not talking about weird sounds coming in. I just mean having that understanding of the energy and records. I recently was lucky to have a conversation with Tristan Takunha on the Synther podcast, which you'll be able to watch, which will be linked around here somewhere. And he spoke about some of the greatest DJs like Craig Richards, Nicholas Lutz, and their ability to understand their records. And it really is an ability to know when things are gonna change, the energy in tracks, when things drop. And the better you know your records, the better you'll perform, because then you'll understand what goes with what. So, this week, I've taken every single record out of my bag and then listened to it in its entirety. So it takes six, seven minutes, maybe longer. And then it's not going back in that bag unless I know what the record is when I look at it. And what I mean is when I pick the record up, do I know, is there a big breakdown? Is there a big intro? What does it sound like? What is the general mood of the track? And only then when I can answer them questions, I'm putting it in my bag. The same would apply if it goes into your USB playlist. You put the tune on iTunes, listen to it in full, and then decide, is it going in the playlist? And I always find that if I'm more critical with the songs that enter the bag or the playlist, I play better. Last weekend, I got loads of new tracks off Friends. I got quite a few bags of records, or box of records from Discogs, and they got shoved in the bag, shoved in the playlist, turned up to the gig, didn't know them that well. So, this is time consuming. It's incredibly time consuming because to listen to tracks in its entirety, like I say, takes seven minutes or so. And then you've got to take, if you're doing these, you've got to take the needle off and then put it in your bag. It can be quite easy to just be like, skip through the record. And we've all done the thing when you go and play a tune and there's, like I say, nasty surprise. But understanding the feeling of the record is gonna help you so much. So that is the first thing I would do when preparing for a set. Secondly, once you have got the tracks you want to use, I think it's really important to have some kind of order. For me, I am now doing it in an energy order. So starting at the front of the record bag is the records that I believe have the least amount of energy. When I say least amount of energy, I mean more the tracks that I feel will kickstart the set. And a lot of the terms I kind of use in my own head when it comes to DJing really just makes sense to me. And don't worry about trying to use exact explanations of DJing, because DJing is a feeling. And to me, this kind of start of the bag is where I kind of feel this well. I'll start with, and as you go through, I'm really aiming to build a coherent vibe that you could start here, and you could play each record in an order, and they'll make some kind of sense. Anyone could do it, ideally. I want this to kind of be a, a bag where they make sense, and I could go through, and 
just be able to take people on a journey, as they say in quotation marks. And it's been really important for me in the past when preparing players for gigs that I go from the start and I can almost just go like, I know that when I put the USB in, I'm not scrolling around. I know I've already pre-listened to the tracks and they're going to go in some kind of energy order. So say you've only got, for now, we're just going to talk about one playlist and then one record bag. Obviously, you could maybe have a separate record bag if you had loads of different tunes. You can do separate playlists, but we're going to come on to the playlist afterwards. But having this kind of direction is important. And I find that I play best when I have to do less kind of looking through, like, what's that track? What's that track? What's that track? And I've said this before, that it's really important that when you go to a gig, you want things to flow as well as possible. And if you're there looking at the record, having to take it out the sleeve, put it on the deck, then like, shit, this isn't the right track. Put it back in, you start sweating, you're not on, on your game, you can ruin the whole thing. And I've had that before where I've almost played a record, it's not the one I thought, then it's, you wanna play the B side, you play the A side, and it's got a big raunchy vocal on it. And yeah, it can really throw you off. And when you're trying to deliver the best service possible, you don't want things like that to happen. So for me, it's kind of how to at the start, and then we go a bit more kind of electro acidy in the middle, and then it kind of goes a bit tranty at the back and then back to the house. And for me, this is a proper you and me bag because I know that the crowd really respond to great music and I've really been able to pack freely for that. And that moves me on to the next point. When preparing for a gig, you need to think about where you are playing. You, I could not take this bag to part life, for example. It would not be the appropriate selections for part life if it was two in the afternoon. I would take probably more houseier stuff, more, I use the term crowd friendly. I would not be packing the finest German 1997 trance for a gig at part life. And this is the thing, someone asked me yesterday, I'm playing a set at a festival, should I respect the timetable? He's playing at 1 p.m. and he said that he likes to play certain artist tracks. He named two artists. And I replied saying that you have to respect the timetable if you are a good DJ. You would not just turn up at 2 p.m. and stick to your own thing. And then he said, what if I wouldn't want to play that? I said, well, part of being a DJ is finding records you would want to play that fit that situation. You don't conform to be someone else. You don't turn up and start playing really cheesy music, music subjective, so I don't want to kind of make this genre, um, genre specific. But if you go to a gig and you're playing at one in the afternoon and you're like stubborn and you start playing bangers, not only is it just completely ridiculous and you're gonna give the ravers a bad experience, it's gonna fuck the DJs up after you, it kind of just shows inexperience and it's not really how you should DJ. I think Toby Newman said something wise. He was saying DJing is a service and you're offering a service to people and you can't be selfish with it. People should come to have a good time. So when preparing, you've got to think about where you're playing. So last weekend, Maidstone, I kind of prepared more digital stuff, more bangers, because I kind of had an, uh, an inkling that it's not a massive city, it's a bit smaller. You've got to think the crowd are there, they're probably not as into the tunes. And well, let's say into the tunes not as curious to find more underground music. They kind of want to go and hear bangers, some things they're more familiar with. Whereas this weekend, you and me, I know people want to see what I've got in here. They want to hear the more obscure records and it makes it a different experience to pack for, but thinking about where you're playing is so important. And I think people do make that mistake that when they're starting out, they just have a one playlist fits all thing. Whereas I think always adapting to different situations is good. So if you're playing an extreme example, someone's birthday, you probably, well, depends whose birthday is, but if you're playing a family birthday, it's a really good experience to go and play some like disco records. And I think one of the things that I have earned my stripes with over the years is kind of playing parties when I was like 16, 17, 18, and having that understanding of a party and playing different kind of records. And I kind of got into a habit early on of going to friends at the weekend and always kind of prepare different things for different places. And yeah, I've always stuck with that now. So every party, think about what you're playing and just be sensible with your selections. And it's better to prepare too many records and not enough. But yeah, don't be stubborn and try and stick to your way. So next, this brings us on to Record Box and talking a bit more about how I prepare digitally for gigs. So like I say, every gig, you wanna think about where you're playing and pack slash drag and drop accordingly. 
And my method with Rekordbox is to create a new folder for each gig. A lot of people make new playlists, but if you right click, you can click new folder. And what you can do is you can put playlists inside the folder, which was a game changer for me because obviously the annoying thing about a record bag is that you've got to physically go through everything. And ideally I probably would have like a, if you could have a levitating side drawer that pulls out the maybe garage records, it'd be really easy to organize because say you went on a more garagey tip for half an hour, you could just slot them records out. Obviously you could pull them out, but you know, fiddling through 40 odd records can be kind of annoying. And when you get to a gig, you don't necessarily want to take your records out your bag because who knows what's getting thrown around. So the beauty of Record Box is the playlist inside folders. If you've not done this before, get on it, so good. So each folder I always call the gig coming up or now it's probably gonna be months because I've got more gigs than before. It used to be maybe one gig a month. So I could kind of just prepare for each gig, but now I'm probably gonna do one folder per month. So what it's gonna be is an evolution of the next. I've said this quite a lot in the podcast that gigging is easier when you kind of got a backbone to it and you're building on from that. So you might have your backbone of your set which kind of doesn't change too much even wherever you play. What you can do then is just develop it and during the months, you can add more tunes to it and kind of get a bit of a sound going there. And you always see the records that DJs keep playing. So what you do is you make your folder and then I like to do it like this. So this makes sense to me. Like I say, it might go over your head, but I'm gonna try and get some footage in here so you can see. I have the name of the month slash gig as the folder name. Then I've got A, B, C. I'm gonna talk about them first. So A is like my record bag. This is this, right? And if you imagine that A is your foot on the gas, right? So A, ideally, give or take a few tracks. It goes in some kind of chronological order that I would probably build on. So when I get to the gig, put the USB in, obviously it depends who's on before me, put the USB in, start playing the records and I kind of just go down, maybe skip two, three out and just go down. Obviously this is not robotic, DJing is a feeling, you can't pre-plan everything, that's worth remembering. So go through the playlist and then my A is just my record bag. So the same kind of feeling, what I explained before. But then my B, this is interesting, B is my break, my foot off the gas and A may have from 20 tunes to 100 tunes. It really depends on the amount of tunes I've been digging, the amount of tunes that I'm really liking at the moment, and also the gig, if it's a longer set, I'll have more tunes. But B is the foot on the gas, is how I envision it. I know some people do it one, two, three, but I do it A, it's just like a standard thing. I don't know if anyone does this. This is like the, this might be groundbreaking um, invention from Josh Baker. B is the foot on the gas, so what you do is, if, the tr if it's going a bit too much, I need to bring it down a bit. I usually have like a selection of 10 tracks, which are either break beats, maybe just like synthy, dreamy stuff. And these can be good for moments as well of just, say you've been banging out tunes for 45 minutes, no hold up, barely any breakdowns. This B is where I can go to and I know there's gonna be some more soothing stuff. Maybe you need to breathe it yourself just to take it all in. Big mistake people make when the DJ is not taking in what's going on. They've got their head down, you know, like just going full throttle for the whole time, look up and then the set's finished. They've not even considered if the crowd are enjoying it or anything like that. So this B is like the foot on the gas, take a step back, is it going how I want it to? Or it can be that hands in the air magical moment, you know, when people remember that track. And then C is the opposite. That's let's take it up a notch. That's if we're at the start of the playlist and we're like, hmm, we need to step up a bit here and then we put one of them on and it's usually like a bit of turbo injection. These might take you all the way to the bottom of A and you might have actually gone through all your tracks and you just move on to that. So they will typically be tunes with bigger breakdowns, bigger beats, heavier drums, you know, and just, we all know them kind of tracks. And C is just that escape go, which is just like, let's go. Then we have a playlist called Tools, right? So we've got A, B, C, and Tools. Tools are my tools. They are vocal tracks or cool acapellas. The ones I'll lay on the third deck. When I play DJ, I'm playing with the mixer, two CDJ, three CDJs, two Technics. Um, and usually I'll have some kind of vocal on the third, two group, then two tracks playing, whether it be two tracks on the Technics or two tracks CDJ. And this has got kind of like your classics as well. So I've got some classics that I really love playing. 
And these kind of things can give you a signature, you know. We've all seen Ricardo, Luciano, play them records that they've played for like 10 years. Like, since I've been going out, I've seen Ricardo play some certain classics. And it's about finding tracks that you love from back in the day or tracks you've heard and just putting them into your own sets and giving yourself some character. There is the argument of like, oh, it's a bit cheesy, but I've always been one to like, it's a party. I remember it's a party and I don't take it too seriously in terms of trying to play the coolest underground records. I do that but while keeping it fun. Um, so tools, yeah, tools consists of just acapellas as well. It takes time finding them and then when you find them that they work, it's really good to use. Some people I know just play like one track into the other, which is fine, but I'm someone who quite likes to get busy when I'm playing and I've really mastered it over the years of how to keep things going and, and yeah. So after tools, we have one called moments and moments is usually just like three or four tracks, three or four tracks that I've got them in there because these are gonna be the moment of the night. And it's something I've done for a long time, this moments thing of always going into every gig with one track which is gonna blow the roof off. This is assuming you're playing the appropriate set time. Don't want to blow the roof off at 1 p.m. at your mate's birthday party. But I always take them, a few, all them in the record bag. There's a few in there that I know this is gonna be the one, you know, the video, the viral, there's something. And just being prepared for that. And you can see here, all these things just add up to get into the gig and be much more confident. And I will admit that there are times when I've not prepared as well. And it really makes a difference because you can get them gigs here yeah, where the records flow out the bag, the USB picks itself. And sometimes you get there and they don't quite pick themselves. I think there are multiple reasons why they pick themselves sometimes and it can be due to the intoxication. And then you've got a question, are the records really picking themselves or are you just lying to yourself and they don't actually sound that good? And this is a conversation with multiple people that if you go too hard in the party and then DJ and you think it was an amazing set, sometimes it probably wasn't that amazing. It was just you lying to yourself. But with this preparation, you could probably still get wasted and use your intuition of the kind of rough planning and get away with it. Obviously, you can play blinds as well, freehand, but I think having some kind of um, structure helps me a lot. And the one thing which I would say is the hardest when playing records and CDJ is getting the thing to be coherent between the two. Because obviously, I prefer just playing one or the other, if I'm honest. But it's something I need to try and mix between the two because I've got great records on there and great records on there. And I really want to play them both together, but sometimes when I'm playing records, I just really love getting stuck into the feeling and just, uh, you know, just going for it. And with CDJs, it's just a quicker thing, easier. And I think sometimes it depends on like the time of the night or things like that. But yeah, they both have their place. And for tomorrow, this is going to be the backbone of the set and a few of them might slot in. So the final playlist is just one full of unreleased music from myself. I always have this, so it's easy to access. Um, I take music from friends as well and put that in there. But this is just good to have that kind of, know where your tunes are and be able to access them straight away and not have to um, be fiddling going to the playlist. So I've always got a playlist inside of each folder with all my latest tracks, tracks from friends and things like that. So yeah, the biggest tip I can give everyone though is knowing your records. If you can look through your bag, look through your playlist and really know what that record sounds like, you can have the up hand on people straight away because then you can start to think about what goes with each other and when you know what goes well with each other, you can kind of build on from it. I think DJing is all about just this big journey of figuring out what works now, then next week getting some more. Then before you know it, you can have a whole collection of music where you know it really well and you can build these amazing sets. But... It is always worth remembering that DJing is a feeling and there is not a formula to it. People keep asking this question about how to prepare and I did dodge it for a bit because I don't want to try and formulize DJing because it really can't be formalized. You can do things like this to be better equipped to play. But still, I think the important thing is being able to read the crowd, feel the crowd, be in the moment, be patient. You can't rush things when you get there and just Generally taking it seriously as well. Don't turn up and get super wasted and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's really, really common. Trust me, booking superstar DJs and then they come and get wasted. It's kind of like crazy sometimes. But 
take it seriously and be prepared and it makes your life much easier. So a nice thing inside record box as well that's worth mentioning is the hot cues function. This is something I like to use a lot on tools so I can cue it straight in where the vocal comes. And also good if a track's got really long intros. They're really easy to set up. I'm sure there is YouTube videos on there you don't need to show you. But having hot cues accessible uh, all the time is really good because you might think, shit, a vocal would sound good here. Third deck, hot cue, vocal in, and it's bang it straight in. Whereas if you're trying to fast forward all this stuff when you're on the decks, it can uh, slow you down. And that is the probably only bad thing. Well, not the only bad thing. There are multiple things that are the drawback of vinyl, such as the weight of carrying them, the size, and the fact that you can't just always skip to the part of the track you want. You've got to queue up yourself, but then also, that is part of the beauty. And just to remind you, there is not a versus between the two. They're completely different in their own way. And I think the combination of the two is the best because finding music is much funner when it comes to the vinyl stuff. And we'll do a video on that at another point. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that video and it's gonna help you preparing for your next DJ set. I will be posting some more videos, explaining my DJ process, maybe some tips and techniques on the actual deck soon. But in the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll catch you soon.